Welcome everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. If you are here for the brown bag lunch uh, sponsored by BAI on HIV vaccines, research and trends, and you are in the right place. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes and let folks trickle in for those of you who are watching via Zoom. Uh, and then we'll get started really shortly. To all of our viewers who are watching via Zoom, feel free to use the chat feature to introduce yourself and say hello. We're so happy that you can join us and we'll just probably start in about a minute or less. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get uh, get started, and then those who would like to join us after uh, will be able to still do so. Uh, so good morning to everyone out on the West Coast, afternoon to folks who are like me in the middle of the country or on the East Coast. I'm located in Central Virginia. Uh, welcome to the Black AIDS Institute's Brown Bag Lunch Series. We are so excited that you're able to tune in today. My name is Tanisha Lewis. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm BAI's Senior Manager of Training and Capacity Building. BAI's mission is to stop the AIDS epidemic in Black communities by engaging and mobilizing Black institutions and individuals to confront HIV. And we advance this mission with activities like our Brown Bag Lunch Series. Every single month, we're bringing in people who can speak to HIV-related issues facing Black Americans. This month in May, we are highlighting efforts in vaccine research to coincide with the HIV Vaccine Awareness Day, which was last week on the 18th. Our May Brown Bag Lunch session is focused on educating Black Americans and allies about the importance of preventive HIV vaccine research, as well as elevating the community members, the health professionals, and the scientists who are working together toward a safe, effective HIV vaccine. So today, I am extremely happy to introduce Dr. Hyman Scott, who is the medical director of Bridge HIV, which is part of the San Francisco Department of Health. And Dr. Scott oversees many of Bridge HIV's prevention research initiatives to include HVTN and HPTN research studies and work. So with all of that being said, we're going to turn the session over to Dr. Scott's expertise. He will share some words about his work and the importance of vaccine research, and then we'll have a Q&A period. So please feel free to ask questions using our Q&A feature at any time during this presentation or after. And that Q&A feature is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And we'll have time to, to address your questions following the presentation. Dr. Scott, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Tanisha. I appreciate the introductions, uh, and I'm excited to uh, to be here and talk a little bit about uh, HIV vaccine work. Um, again, my name is Hyman Scott. I use uh, he, him, his pronouns, and um, I'm excited to give just a brief overview of some of our HIV vaccine work and um, and to hear any questions and comments that folks have. So uh, I'll just start with the disclosures. I have uh, no financial disclosures, and um, this is our uh, disclosure form for the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Um, so um, the way that I sort of think about um, what we're doing and why we're doing this is that this is sort of like a prevention puzzle that we use, and this is focused on biomedical. 
uh, HIV prevention. So we have uh, some tools and hopefully we'll have more tools available. And so PrEP uh, daily and on demand, STI testing and treatment and condoms um, are really cornerstones of our, um, of our HIV prevention efforts uh, nationally and internationally. Um, but there are other things that are in development and have really a, a impact, a potential to impact HIV um, prevention in a way that uh, PrEP has. And, and it's central to that is, is HIV vaccines as they vaccines have, have really, uh, has really helped with our prevention efforts for many different infectious diseases. And the goal is really to, to have a similar approach that we have for uh, contraception. So this is from a really patient-centered uh, website called Bedsider, um, which is really uh, uh, outlined to help um, uh, women decide uh, what types of uh, birth control and contraception works best for them. Um, and it sort of uh, is very patient-oriented, patient-friendly, um, sort of looking at things that are uh, from the most effective, uh, to um, party ready or um, be able to be used um, sort of on shorter notice and then focusing on STI prevention. Um, and really we wanna have uh, as many options for people uh, to fit in their lives as possible. And uh, why do we need this? Um, you know, the, the CDC puts out data every year um, and unfortunately um, the disparities uh, persist and in some cases seem like they're worsening. So between uh, 2010 and 2017, um, uh, Black African Americans in the U.S. have made up about 44 percent of um, all new HIV infections, and this has been stable for at least a decade. Um, we are seeing a slight increase among uh, Hispanic um, and Latin Latinx identified individuals um, over that time period, but um, you know African Americans don't make up 44 percent of the U.S. population, but do uh, make up. Uh, that proportion of the new diagnoses. And so, uh, you know, we need a vaccine because there are 38 million people living with HIV globally with almost 5,000 new infections. And in the US, uh, looking at uh, black men um, who have HIV infection rates that are uh, more than twofold higher than um, all other um, races of men in, in this country. And then black women uh, for whom the disparity is even starker where there are three times um, the number of infections um, in our in our uh, population of Black women in the U.S., so um, a vaccine is is uh, really important to to help um, address and um, and prevent uh, worsening of these disparities that exist within our communities. Um, and what can a, a vaccine make in uh, sort of in a global sense? And so this is. Um, I think another reason why we are focused on uh, vac vaccination as a as a strategy. So um, this is a, um, a modeling exercise. So what we say is that um, all models are wrong in some way, and some are useful. And I think this is useful uh, for a couple of reasons. If we look at what we expect to have as um, you know HIV infections occurring in the green, um, you can see that with a vaccine. Um, uh, that you, we would expect to see this massive drop off over the next, you know, uh, this is uh, going out about 50 years. Um, and what an effective vaccine, even at 50%, can do to um, really change the trajectory of uh, HIV infections that happen both globally as well as um, in the US. So, um, just to give a brief overview of uh, what what vaccines are. I think we've all had a crash course in vaccinations with the COVID pandemic, um, but this is just to reorient for specifically for HIV vaccines. So what vaccines do is really teach um, uh, the body's immune system to recognize and protect against disease. Um, and um, these are vaccines like hepatitis A or flu um, use a whole or weakened form of the virus. Um, but uh, HIV vaccines are um, are more like the vaccines we have for COVID, where there are um, there are no uh, pieces of HIV or actual HIV that are used um, for these vaccinations. Um, and so, one of the common questions we get is, uh, "Can HIV vaccine give me HIV?" Um, and as I said, these are made from synthetic pieces of uh, H of HIV, um, and it's not parts of HIV, so it can't cause infection. One of the um, 
one of the analogies we use is sort of a car. Like if you have pieces of the car, you don't actually have a car. I live in California, so you know we have a Prius. Um, and so similarly for the HIV vaccine, uh, we use DNA or uh, a component of the DNA um, or proteins um, that trigger the immune system to respond, um, but cannot give uh, HIV to somebody. Um, and so what um, these vaccines are really intended to do is to um, trigger your immune system to develop a response, which usually includes antibodies that will um, recognize HIV if you were to be exposed to it. And that those antibodies do sometimes show up on our standard HIV tests, which are designed to detect antibodies. So we spend a lot of time talking to our study participants about that. Um, it's got a, a special name called DISP, vaccine-induced seropositivity. And it's just the uh, vaccine working to uh, trigger your body to make antibodies um, that would recognize HIV. Um, and we do this uh, testing, and this is similar again for COVID. Um, COVID was on a much more compressed timeline, but really it's about um, ensuring it's safe in, um, in animals um, and then going on to, uh, to human studies if there's um, no concern about um, safety that's seen in the earlier phase studies. There are two, two ways that we um, can um, protect using antibodies. One is passive and one is active. This is from one of our um, International AIDS Vaccine Initiative called IAVI. Um, and in the blue, it's uh, passive where there are antibodies, there are people who have developed antibodies to HIV and um, those antibodies can be purified um, and, um, and made in cell culture and then given through an IV infusion. Um, and they sort of um, uh, provide the antibodies without um, your body producing them. Um, and some of those antibodies actually are quite long lived and some can be in the body for six months to a year. Um, the other, which is a more traditional is um, what we call active vaccination where you give um, a, um, an antigen, which is uh, the pieces that we talked about, the synthetic pieces they trigger the body to, to uh, develop a response. Um, and then they produce the, those responses, those produce the antibodies. Um, and so the, um, the, there's benefits and uh, drawbacks from, uh, from each of them, but those are really the two strategies. And there are actually studies that are going on that I'm gonna talk about that, uh, that use uh, each of those. So, um, so where are we now in terms of uh, what's happening with HIV vaccines? So uh, right now there are um, two uh, large vaccine trials that are um, what we call phase three trials. So if they show that they work, they would be used to license a vaccine. And so we don't know if that's gonna happen, um, but that's our hope. And those are uh, the two trials at the, at the bottom. These are an ad, uh, adenovirus uh, vaccine. So this uses a, um, like a, a vector, a viral vector that's not HIV, but it helps to get the synthetic genetic material to trigger the immune response. Um, and there's one that's happening in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then there's one that's happening in the US. Um, so the Mosaico trial, um, HVTN706, I'll talk a little bit about, is actually happening um, uh, in the US. And um, the the sister trial to that uh, in Bokoto um, is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. There was another trial that ended last year. Um, one of the things that all these studies have to ensure safety is um, checks before the end of the study um, to see if it looks like there's one, any concern about safety and two, if it looks like it's gonna um, work or not. And if it doesn't look like it's gonna work, then they stop the study. Um, out of protecting our study participants. So that's what's happened with the HVTN702. That study was supposed to go through the middle of this year, um, but they actually stopped it last year when they saw that it um, didn't look like it was gonna work. Um, so uh, the other trials are still in the field and there has not been a concern that, um, that it's not gonna work yet. And so they're continuing on. And so hopefully we'll have um, some of those data coming out sometime next year. Um, there are two other, uh, there's another study that's looking at using PrEP and, um, and a vaccine together, it's called PrEPVAX. Um, I'm not gonna touch too much on that. Um, and then there's another uh, study that we got results from earlier this year 
called the AMP study, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. And this was also a, a study similar to the, um, the other vaccine studies that are in the field, um, heard both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, um, and in the US. So this is uh, Mosaico. And um, the goal of Mosaico, which is uh, really to develop a global vaccine, um, there are different uh, clades of, um, of HIV that are in different parts of the world. Um, and in the past, the vaccines really focused specifically on that region. So if you're trying to develop a vaccine that uh, covered the, uh, the prominent types of HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in South Africa, um, that vaccine could not be used in, say, the US. But this uses um, uh, pieces of um, the genetic material from these different clades of vaccines so that one vaccine can provide coverage for um, all of the different clades uh, globally. Um, and so this is really a global vaccine. Um, and as I said, this is enrolling um, currently. Um, and our, our hope is that we'll have some initial data next year um, and then um, the following year as well. So we can know whether or not this, um, this vaccine might be, might be effective. And this is a, a graphic of what I was describing in terms of uh, the different clades of, um, of vaccine, uh, of HIV. So a vaccine that covers the blue circles, uh, which is clade C in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, wouldn't necessarily cover the orange that we have in the US unless it was designed to be able to do so. And that's what Mosaico um, really is designed to do is to cover um, all the clades in um, all over the world so that we can have one vaccine. Um, so shifting gears a little bit to uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, which uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about in terms of um, how, they, how they work. And so um, this is a um, animation that just shows how the antibodies um, work to protect uh, in um, exposure to, to HIV. So um, in the body, the antibodies are circulating sort of in your blood. And then if HIV uh, is present, they have uh, binding to the HIV and they block HIV from um, connecting with the CD4 cells or other cells in the body. And that's how you get protection from, from an infection. And so many of these um, HIV um, uh, viruses, they do uh, bind to something called a CD4. And so uh, having antibodies that block that um, part of the connection um, is, is one, a good target because all the viruses have to bind there. Um, and two, um, even if there is mutations that we know happen in um, HIV, then they do have to, what we call, conserve that. Um, so they have to maintain that in order to actually cause an infection. Um, and so this was studied in this uh, two large uh, sibling studies called the AMP studies for antibody mediated protection. Um, and it used an anti-HIV antibody called BRCO1. Um, and it was given to participants by IV infusion. There was a lot of concerns about whether or not people would be okay or interested in this. And um, the study actually uh, proved that, uh, or showed that um, there was so much interest in, in this study at the time that uh, we actually had to slow down enrollments because we were running out of uh, study product because there were so many people interested. Um, we had long lists of people who wanted to, to participate. Um, so this study, um, as I mentioned, um, is, was a, a global study uh, in the US, uh, South America, Europe, as well as um, several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Botswana, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. So um, in the AMP study, uh, there were uh, three, uh, three things that people got. They either got a high dose of the antibody, a low dose of the antibody, or a placebo. Um, and um, people were randomly assigned to receive one of those so that we could see whether or not um, any of them worked um, and any of them worked compared to, um, to placebo. So this is the, the bottom line is circled here. And so um, this study was, uh, the results of this were published earlier this year. And so if you look at the prevention efficacy, so this is whether or not it works, um, the dotted line is zero, it, there's no effect. And um, each of the boxes show for the different studies. So if you look at the, um, at the bottom, um, there, are, these were uh, there was a high dose and low dose and 
uh, if you look across all the trials, um, when you look, when you put everything together, um, they're blue, they're blue uh, boxes, but the little, um, the lines next to them is how confident we are that the truth lies within, um, within those lines. And so all those lines cross the dotted vertical line. So um, that indicates that there is no effect. Uh, there was no efficacy. So this didn't work to protect overall in the way that the study um, uh, was uh, set up. But you'll notice that some of the boxes are on the right and there's one box on the left and the distance from the dotted line is different. Um, and so one of the things that was really was interesting was that when we looked at um, the viruses, so we know that HIV can mutate quite a bit and that there are different levels of sensitivity to um, antiretroviral medications, for example, the same is true for monoclonal antibodies. So when they looked in the study, whether or not if the viruses were sensitive, whether or not they showed protection, they actually saw that it did, that if there were sensitive viruses, this is a blue line in this graph at the very top. So this is, um, you know, uh, less than one microgram per ml, which is a measure of sensitivity. So the lower the number, the more uh, more sensitive. And so if, if the virus was sensitive, it actually did provide evidence of protection. Um, and so it suggested that um, HIV is, is, is always changing. And so it's, it's a lot of work to keep up with it. Um, but that this shows a sort of proof of concept that this strategy might actually work. And this was out through um, 80 weeks of um, follow-up. So, um, you know, I think this is really suggested that um, we're going to need more than one antibody. Um, and there are multiple studies that are, are looking at this in early phases to combine antibodies. Um, and they're being given um, both IV um, and then also subcutaneous through like um, injections just under the skin. Um, and that some of them have uh, two antibodies and some of them have um, three or four antibodies to really cross cover their um, resistance. So that um, we think that if we include three or more antibodies that we might actually get closer to 100% of coverage of, of HIV and, um, and close that gap from the sensitive viruses to the resistant viruses. And so, um, and one of the other strategies, um, instead of giving multiple antibodies, is there's actually an engineered antibody that does um, sort of has three antibodies in one. Um, and um, there is early evidence that this is um, able to provide coverage um, with a small, um, a small dose of either an IV or a subcutaneous injection that might provide the types of protection with the single antibody that you would get with three different antibodies. Um, and so you need a lower dose um, of the antibody to get the same level of protection. So this is um, also being tested for treatment as well as um, being explored for, for use um, in prevention. So, um, you know, we have these two antibody uh, vac HIV vaccine trials that are going on, um, really evaluating if we can develop a global vaccine uh, strategy. Um, and then we have uh, these monoclonal antibodies that are um, in the pipeline that are really going to show us whether or not um, we can um, prove that we can um, have protection with this passive um, uh, immunization strategy and AMP get, gave us some proof of concept for that, that it might be possible. And um, there are many, many studies in the pipeline looking at whether or not um, we can actually prove um, that it would work. And um, this is just a, a, a reminder about how long it takes. It's been 40 years um, on June 5th that the first AIDS cases were reported. Um, and so, um, COVID changed the game you know, significantly when we're talking about six months to a year for development of vaccine. But in general, um, you know, vaccine development has taken um, decades uh, to develop. And so we're in the fourth, we're entering the fourth decade of HIV. Um, and you know, we don't really worry about many of these um, diseases anymore because we have vaccines. And that's really what we want um, for HIV as well is that we, we don't wanna have to worry about um, HIV diagnoses if we have multiple preventive strategies that are um, can be used by individuals to meet their lives and where they are um, and uh, what works for them at the time. 
So um, I will uh, stop there and I'll love to um, have any questions uh, about vaccines or HIV prevention. Um, this is my contact information um, and I'm happy to turn it back over to Tanisha. Wonderful, thank you so much for this great and insightful presentation. We have several questions already and I will just jump right into them. And folks, as you are listening to the responses to these questions, feel free to continue asking. Uh, you can ask them for the uh, duration of our event. We're scheduled to go uh, for another half hour or so. So we've got plenty of time. Okay, so uh, the first question that we have here says, what are the pros and cons of passive and active immunization? Um, so, I'll, so the pros of, um, I'll start with passive uh, and then I'll talk about active. So the pros of passive immunization are that you have immediate protection. So when you get that infusion, you are protected as of that day. Um, and that, the, um, that you um, know what type of levels of uh, antibodies there are. So we know what, how well somebody's protected and it's immediate. Um, and, um, and the other pro of that is that it doesn't depend on your immune response. So if somebody has an immune uh, disorder and they can't develop an immune response, they are actually protected because of the, the passive uh, um, infusion of the antibodies. Um, so the, um, the cons of, um, of the passive immunization strategy is that one is more complicated. So this isn't something that we can just, you know, go door to door offering flu vaccines or even COVID vaccines. It takes more of a medical infrastructure oftentimes to administer it. Um, and um, and the, the, the pros of uh, active immunization is that um, it is often easier to distribute um, and that um, it will um, often give longer um, protection. So hepatitis B vaccination, for example, you have those memory cells in your body so that if you have that protection for years and decades and decades, um, you don't have that for passive immunization. That's another con of passive immunization um, is that you, once those antibodies are gone, you lose your protection, but with active, you would remain, you would uh, maintain it. The cons of active um, immunizations often it takes multiple vaccinations to get to the level of protection that you could get immediately with passive. So there's a, a, a gap between when you um, first get your dose and when you're fully protected. We see this with COVID vaccinations, right? So after you're, you're not fully protected until two weeks after your second dose. So that's an example of the delay that can happen uh, with active uh, immunization. Um, and another con of active immunization is particularly for our people uh, who are living with HIV, who might have a really low CD4 count, um, the response to the vaccinations can be variable. So if somebody has uh, gotten chemotherapy, for example, they might not be able to, um, to have a response. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got another question uh, regarding the research process. Uh, and the question says, how exactly is it tested in humans? And during the trial period after administering the vaccine, do you then give the human the HIV to see if vaccines are working? Um, so that's a, that's a great question. So um, <clears throat> I'll start with the first part of how exactly it's tested in humans. So what we do is we uh, recruit individuals into the um, study initially who are at low risk for HIV. Um, and so if those, uh, and we test, we test in a small number of people just to make sure that the vaccine is safe and that there are no side effects that are troublesome for, for people. And then it moves into the, the next phase, which is a larger phase. Um, and in those larger phases, which are generally a few thousand people, uh, we're testing to see if it works to prevent against HIV. And no, we do not give people HIV. Um, we know that individuals are, um, you know, we see that there are, you know, 30, 40, 35 to 40,000 HIV infections that happen in the US. Um, despite our best efforts to support HIV prevention, um, there are people who are exposed to HIV and are diagnosed. Um, and so we recruit individuals who um, are at risk for HIV. We provide them with counseling. We provide them with condoms. In the Mosaico study, actually, we are referring everyone for PrEP um, as we know that that's a, um, a very highly effective HIV prevention. Um, and then 
you, we know that despite our counseling, despite our um, our efforts, despite our um, desires to make sure that everyone stays highly protected, that there are still people who might, might get exposed uh, to HIV. Um, and so th those are the individuals that we recruit into the study and we do not give them, we do not expose them to HIV. We counsel them how to protect themselves against HIV. Um, and we follow them out for a very long time, so two to three years. Um, and then that's how we identify whether or not the vaccine, in addition to all the other things that we offer, provides um, protection um, from HIV. Wonderful, thank you. And so this next question is dealing with HIV and COVID, and we know the two are pretty parallel. So the question asks, how can HIV vaccine research and trial piggyback off of the COVID-19 successes in terms of the rapidity from trial to market? So I, I think that's a that's a great question. And I um, I wish, I hope we can get to a place where we can actually do that. So I think uh, the biggest difference between COVID-19 successes and everything else that we've done is the amount of money that has been poured into this uh, response in a, ma in a very short amount of time. Um, I also think that the, um, the strategies that are being used for COVID-19, for example, Pfizer and Moderna are using a new strategy for vaccinations, um, that's mRNA. Um, and um, one of the key differences, both between HIV and COVID, but also HIV and most other vaccinations is that with many infections, when, you, when somebody gets exposed they, and they recover, they have some level of immune protection. Um, that's not true for HIV. And so HIV has a much more um, complicated route to get to a place because we're actually trying to trigger something that doesn't naturally happen uh, when people are exposed um, to HIV. Um, and so that's why this, um, this approach is, is different. I think that the mRNA vaccinations might be a, a strategy because there are some people who are um, who are highly exposed to HIV and do have some uh, antibodies that are protective, um, and it's not a hundred. It's not a hundred percent. And so, using an mRNA vaccine that might require multiple vaccinations to help mimic the evolution that happens in people who have some protection is is one strategy. But I think the rapidity was really about, um, to be frank, it was about money. Um, and it was about the billions and billions and billions of dollars that was poured into it um, in a very, trillions actually in a very short amount of time. Um, and two, that um, we had um, a natural immunity that can occur with COVID as people recover. Great, thank you. And so the next question is also related to COVID. Uh, and it asks, isn't adenovirus 26 and HIV vaccine trials the same as the one in J&J &J COVID vaccine? If so, would women under 50 be at risk for clotting disorder identified in the J&J &J vaccine? And should the vector be changed to avoid risk in the trials and in the case, in case the vaccine is eventually approved? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So the AD26 vaccine is the, uh, the same one, it's the same vector that's being used um, in the J&J &J vaccine. It's also the same one that's being used in the Ebola vaccine actually that Johnson & Johnson has. Um, and so there is a lot of data looking at whether or not um, whether or not we're seeing the same level of uh, clotting risk that we've seen with the COVID vaccines, or if it is um, is it also about the protein that it encodes for? So um, we uh, we haven't seen these data when they've looked at both the 705 trial and the 706 and the Ebola data. Um, there hasn't been the same uh, reports of clotting that um, we've seen with the J&J COVID-19 vaccine. So I think that that's an, uh, an excellent question. And um, as of right now, we don't have evidence that the non-COVID um, AD26 vectored vaccines have the same clotting disorder risk as the ones in COVID, um, but it is something that is um, so it is is extremely um, uh, we have a, we have a lot of attention being paid to it. So we've already looked back at all the data from all those trials um, to evaluate um, if there's any indication that that's happening because we would want to be very very careful 
um, as we move forward. So safety is always the first and foremost uh, thing we look at in these trials and after anything is licensed. Um, and we're learning a lot from these COVID vaccines. Great, thank you. And so the next question asks, how are you measuring efficacy in the AMP trial? So um, efficacy was is measured in um, in the overall efficacy was measured via the number of people who acquired HIV and was it different in each of the arms? So the high dose, the low dose, and the placebo. And so the overall efficacy was measured was was there uh, fewer HIV infections in one of the arms that received the uh, antibody than those that did not. And so the answer was no, there was no efficacy. There was no statistically significant difference between those who received the salt water and those that received either the high or the low dose. Um, and then there was, the, um, there was another more, I guess, nuanced analysis that looked at um, the sensitivity of the viruses that were identified in, among those who did acquire HIV and whether or not uh, there seemed to be a difference uh, in efficacy based on that. That wasn't the primary analysis. So the answer to the question of whether AMP uh, prevented HIV infections was no. Um, a second question was, is there a subset of, um, is there a subset of uh, people for whom it did work? And the answer to that was yes. And that subset was the people who had this, um, nor exposed to a more uh, sensitive virus. Great, uh, we've got a quick question uh, that I can actually answer. Uh, someone wanted to know if there will be a recording of this published. So you can find all of the recordings for our Brown Bag Lunch series on our YouTube channel at Black AIDS. And I'll also provide that information later on uh, at the end of our talk. And then if you have trouble, I'll give you my, uh, my email and you can reach out to me directly and I can point you in the right direction. So there's also a question uh, that says, you stated that there are synthetic parts of HIV being used during the trials for the vaccine. How do the antibodies recognize the syn synthetic strand versus the real thing? If it's working to block the synthetic, does it recognize the real thing? So, um, so the way that we try to um, answer that is we will um, do the early stage trials to see if there is a, um, if there's an immune response. So that's one of the phase one, phase two, early phase trials we do, is we do to see if, is there an antibody response and do we have a suggestion that that antibody response um, is protective when we sort of take those antibodies and try to, um, in, a, in a laboratory, uh, see if they can block HIV. Um, we don't really know whether or not it can, um, you know, protect against HIV until we do the larger trials. So we are extremely selective and only would do a large trial with the, with the vaccines that have the best likelihood of, of being successful. So there's a lot of uh, early, you saw that list of the monoclonal antibody trials. There's a lot of those trials for vaccines as well that don't move forward because it doesn't meet the thresholds for that we have, which are a very high um, bar um, to move into a larger um, trial. So, so the short answer is, um, is yes. Um, and so the, the way that they uh, recognize the, the real thing is that it is, um, so HIV hijacks the immune response to produce uh, copies of itself. And so um, it's using the same machinery to produce um, proteins that look just like the same proteins that HIV would make if it were to infect the body. And so that's how um, it's a synthetic. So it's not a full HIV virus. It's just part of the um, genetic uh, code to code for a very small part of the proteins. And those proteins are going to be made in the same machinery that um, HIV would make its proteins in. And so that's how they are synthetic pieces, but they code for proteins that would be the sim similar to what HIV would, would code for. Great, thank you. And so this next question is about participants. So is your research inclusive with transgender men involved? I keep seeing MSM on main report charts and the word trans people, which generally is limited to trans women because they were just recently separated from MSM categories. If you all have included us trans men in the research, where can we find it to follow the progress over time, if any? 
So this has been, uh, this is an excellent uh, question and an excellent point. And I think holding us uh, in the research um, field accountable for, uh, for inclusion. So um, in the past, trans men were not um, routinely included in our, uh, especially in the large clinical trials. That was not true for AMP. Uh, AMP did include both trans uh, men, transgender men and transgender women. And we are now referring to MSM as cisgender uh, men who have sex with men, um, and then uh, including transgender men and transgender women. So Mosaico inclu is inclusive of transgender men as well. Um, and um, those data are sh for AMP, for example, are reported in the, um, in the uh, publication, and I'm happy to share any of the data that we have, but AMP did include uh, transgender men. Um, some of the other older clinical trials have not. Um, and so uh, our moving forward, we are um, holding ourselves accountable for um, ensuring that there's a scientific rationale um, for inclusion and exclusion of any group, um, including uh, transgender men. Great, thank you. This next question is uh, with respect to the social response to HIV vaccines. Uh, so seeing the resistance to vaccines right now, so that, for example, the COVID-19 vaccine, and given the state of acceptance of vaccine right now, how would you approach encouraging individuals to get this vaccine when it's available? So, um, you know, we have a lot of, we have vaccine hesitancy. And I think that there is, there are people who want more information and want to uh, wait and see. And then there are people who are anti-vax and are, you know, in some ways unmovable. And so I think that what we want to do is we want to be transparent and open and, um, and give uh, information and share information in a sort of digestible way. Um, and so I think that once it's available, I think part of it is uh, having communication through um, online trusted uh, voices, as well as healthcare providers and other trusted um, entities within the communities to really um, to allow people to answer questions, to ask questions and have them answered um, in a transparent way and be truthful and clear about the things that we know and the things that we don't know. Um, and um, and validate that you know people's concerns and reservations, um, you know, as have come up often with COVID nineteen vaccine um, rollout, are are valid, and you know we want to just answer people's questions. So, um, you know, I, I I hope that we learn a lot of lessons from this COVID nineteen vaccine um, challenges and can can leverage that to um, to support vaccinations. Um, for HIV once it's available, but also we have other vaccines, you know, we have in the Bay Area, you know, we have students who are traveling, coming back with measles and then getting on our public transit. And, you know, we have outbreaks and exposures that are happening. So, um, so I think it, it's an opportunity to, to address uh, vaccines in a more broader holistic way as well. Awesome. So the next question says, looking at the chart earlier and seeing how vaccines have been developed quicker with better technology, why is an HIV vaccine so much harder even with better medicine and technologies we have access to today? Um, so I think one of the, the biggest um, things that uh, explains that difference is that all of the vaccines in the past have really, um, including COVID-19 actually, have really hinged on um, leveraging and understanding how natural immunity happens and then mimicking that with vaccinations. We don't have that um, benefit with the HIV vaccine. This has to be an entirely different process that's different than the way that, um, you know, natural immunity, because it just doesn't happen in, in the same way. It's, it's extremely, extremely rare. Um, and so it's, it's harder to, to mimic that um, and that's why it's so much harder. And that hopefully we can have some, uh, some techn technological breakthroughs that allow us to, um, to be able to, um, to develop a vaccine that does provide protection. I think that's why the passive Im immunization was so appealing um, because it does allow you to sort of bypass that natural immunity step, which is very difficult to do um, with HIV. 
Um, but the Mosaico uh, studies do seem like they have a uh, potential to do that. Um, so we're just, we wanna wait and see what the trials show us because the trials will give us an answer um, either way. You know, I think a positive answer is what we all hope for, but you know, a negative answer is still an answer. And we wanna do these in a ethical, um, um, a high quality way so that we get the answer that we, um, that we know is, is as close to the truth as possible. Great, thank you. All right, so we've got about 14 minutes left and we'll go ahead and address the remainder of these questions. And the next one says, can you shed any light on the carbohydrate carrying antigen PK and how it relates to resistant uh, HIV, how it relates to resistant to HIV infection? Can this help move vaccines along? Um, so I think that this question is uh, asking about um, uh, so HIV, uh, many of the proteins that are in your body are not just like the proteins, but actually have sugars attached to them. I mean, I think that's what the carbohydrate is referring to. Um, and that those sugars are um, on these proteins and they sort of in some ways provide like a, a cloak or a cover that makes it hard for the antibodies which recognize a protein to see them because the sugars are sort of sitting on top and blocking the way. Um, and so that's one way that um, we call it glycosylation or, or glucose added to the, to the protein. Um, and that sort of shields the protein from your antibodies immune response. Um, and so uh, ensuring that the proteins that get developed sort of in the synthetic way also have some element of that so that you can ensure that the antibodies you produce are going to actually be effective when they see, um, you know, a real HIV antigen. Um, and then the PK is is really is pharmacokinetics is really like how the antibody levels um, uh, change throughout the timeline. Um, and so having a very high level at a time of exposure is really important because at some point you're going to get to a level where um, if the antibody is not high enough, it's not going to provide protection and HIV is going to be able to sort of, sort of think about it like a fence. It's going to be able to get through the fence if there are too many holes in it. And the PK closes the holes um, in the chain link um, so that HIV uh, hopefully would not be able to get through. And so, um, so the, the levels of antibody and what level of antibody you need to prevent HIV from break, breaking through um, is sort of what the, the PK is. Um, and so that, and, and if it's low enough that it's, um, it's low, if, it, if the PK or the levels are, are low enough that HIV just has some resistance to getting through, but doesn't get blocked, then that will allow those strains or um, viruses that are slightly resistant to break through and sort of become the predominant um, strain that exists there. Um, and so, you know, I think understanding how, what level we need. So if we need a really high level of antibodies, um, you know, that's not achievable through active vaccination, then that really puts us in the favor of passive immunization where you can give really high levels. Um, and then really high levels also have to be tolerable. You know, we have to be in a volume that we can actually administer. I think it also, um, uh, the vaccine, uh, so the passive antibodies would need to be um, concentrated in such a way that you might be able to give them um, uh, via subcutaneous injection as well. So there's a lot of uh, variables that go into, um, you know, uh, how and what we would do with an HIV vaccine or uh, a monoclonal antibody um, to help to help move this process along. But excellent, excellent question. So we have about 10 minutes left and we have uh, four questions and one comment to address and we'll be able to do so in a semi-rapid response way uh, before we close out. Uh, so the next question says, in your opinion, does COVID mimic HIV in the way it works, spreads, and who is more at risk? Um, no, um, it doesn't. Um, so COVID is, uh, or SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is a respiratory virus. So it's spread through droplets, aerosolization. Um, it's, there's more and more data that uh, contact with surfaces is less of a, a driver. 
Um, and HIV is really, you know, close contact with bodily fluids. So blood, semen, vaginal fluid, um, breast milk, those kinds of things. I will say that the, the stigma related to COVID-19 was very familiar to the stigma that existed and exists with HIV. Um, so I think in the way that stigma drives HIV infections, I think particularly all on stigma drove a lot of the COVID-19 infections as well. Um, and I think that um, those who are most at risk is, is different. Um, for um, for COVID-19, we've seen in many communities, um, you know, the risk of acquisition and the risk of death were, were slightly different. We have about 30% of our COVID deaths in nursing homes um, and HIV is uh, concentrated in um, men who have sex with men uh, in the US, cisgender men who have sex with men, transgender women um, who have sex with men in the US primarily. Um, <clears throat> and so the risk um, categories are, are different for COVID-19 um, and HIV. Great. So this next question uh, is related to parallels with COVID as well. Uh, do you think that the, that the groundwork should be laid now for overcoming hesitancy if and when a vaccine becomes available, since there's a much longer timeline uh, than we had with planning for COVID? Uh, I, I think so. You know, I think that one of the things that um, COVID really highlighted and revealed was a lot of the disinvestment that we've had in many of our communities. Um, and so I'm hopeful that in response to the COVID pandemic and all of the resources associated with, with that, that we can um, reinvest in, in those communities and that there's a lot of investment in um, sort of community engagement, community um, education around COVID, uh, sorry, around HIV vaccines. Um, and that, um, you know, we don't have a, F we don't have a vaccine that works uh, currently. So, um, I think that we want to definitely leverage the work that's happening now. Like this is an example of that. So we are a clinical research site. I spend we spend a lot of time and effort answering community questions about uh, vaccines, so that if we do have a vaccine, that it's not, um, you know, that there are folks there, that we've had an opportunity to talk to people and answer their questions early on. So so yes, I think we definitely are trying to lay that groundwork. Um, for answering people's questions um, and planning for success, because that's what we we all are in this game to to try to to find a vaccine that's safe and effective. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, this next one says, given the understanding that youth as young as 14 are being infected with HIV, were any of the participants younger than 16, would the vaccine be removed for? would be recommended, excuse me, uh, as a pre pre preventive measure in adolescents and teens when it's found effective. And just for uh, those who are listening, let me repeat one more time. Uh, so given the understanding the youth as young as 14 are being infected, were any of the participants younger than 16, would the vaccine be recommended uh, as a preventive measure in adolescents and teens when it's found effective? Um, so um, no, there were, um, most of the studies actually um, have an, a lower limit of 18 for um, for enrollment. And that's, that's been generally the approach for uh, most uh, drugs, honestly, most drugs and um, vaccinations. Um, it really focused on the adult population first. And then when it's shown to be effective and um, preventative, um, then it's uh, expanded. So you see this exact thing happening with COVID-19. So um, Pfizer, um, did have uh, approval, uh, sorry, did include individuals down to 16, but Moderna didn't, actually in the other studies didn't either. Um, but generally it's adults who are 16 or 18. Um, and then if it's shown to be effective, they're what we call bridging studies that allow you to evaluate um, people younger down to 12 or down to 14. So absolutely, we, um, we have a, always have an eye towards adolescents uh, and ensuring that adolescents have access. But it's also balanced out with not with not putting adolescents at undue risk. So, you know, this risk isn't the same for a 14 year old um, to receive an experimental product that we don't know works in the same way, and particularly around consent, um, in the same way an adult can consent. So, um, it's this ethical balance of ensuring access without putting at undue risk. Um, and I think the the balance has always been on protecting. Um, and minimizing risk, particularly among those who are minors, 
Um, and so uh, first starting with adults and then doing a rapid uh, translation of that for people who are under 16 or 18. And that's sort of what's been happening with the, um, with the COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. Great. So I'll read the uh, suggestion or comment that we have first, and then I'll combine our last two questions into one uh, so that then we can wrap up. Uh, so the suggestion says, may I make an open suggestion that gender nonconforming non-binary people are included in future data collection as well? It's good to know that trans men are included as well, and we thank you for making sure we are involved in your study. Thank you for your input. Um, so the last two questions are going to be combined into one and then we'll wrap up. Do you suspect that we will require booster shots for HIV prevention based on the current data that you see? And did you talk about treatment and therapy, therapeutic vaccines for HIV or mainly prevention vaccines? Um, so the first question is, will we require booster shots for HIV prevention? Um, I think the, the short answer is probably. Um, we, we know that um, with, HIV, with the current HIV vaccines, the, um, the immune response does seem to, to go down and wane um, over time. And so thinking about the discussion around PK, there's gonna be a certain level that is gonna be needed to be protected. And once you go below that level, we're gonna wanna boost it to keep it above the level. And we know that people have risk for HIV that can go on for many, many years. And we don't want them to, uh, we want them to maintain their um, protection. Um, and so I think that there will probably be boosters. Um, it depends on how you know, good the vaccine, if we find a vaccine, how good it, how well it works. Um, and um, you know, the, the studies, the trials will allow us to, to be able to answer those, those questions. Um, and the last question was uh, uh, therapeutic vaccines. So yes, there are therapeutic uh, vaccines for HIV. So when, when I'm talking about HIV vaccines, I'm talking about prevention of infection. There's another uh, vaccine pathway that really prevents progression of disease. Um, and then, um, you know, there's also vaccines being evaluated for looking at cure strategies. So can we actually cure people with HIV um, using vaccines? Many of those strategies are um, multi-pronged. So it's vaccines and some medications um, to, uh, to address the reservoir of HIV that exists in people who are living with HIV. Um, and so uh, we're, we weren't uh, looking, I wasn't discussing the therapeutic vaccines, but there are uh, therapeutic vaccine research that's also going on. All right, these are really great questions and comments. Thank you all for your participation. And that does it for this week. Thanks so much to Dr. Hyman Scott for sharing his experience and insights with all of us. Uh, if you'd like to reach either of us, uh, you can connect with me via email and I'll put my email in the chat. But for those who are listening, it's Tanisha L at blackaids.org. That's T-E-N-E-S-H-A-L at blackaid.org. Uh, recordings from this and our other uh, BBL sessions are available approximately one week or so after the live webinar on our Black AIDS YouTube channel. Uh, please be sure to check us out for these webinars every fourth Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, which I believe is 1 p.m. Central and 2 p.m. Eastern. You can stay updated on our events by following BAI on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black AIDS, and by subscribing to our website, blackaids.org. Once again, my name is Tanisha Lewis, Senior Manager of Training and Capacity Building at the Black AIDS Institute. I'm wishing everyone a wonderful into your week, a happy holiday weekend. Please stay safe and be well.